BBC T Channel 13, Charlottetown. This is a kind of uh, mindless paternalism which deprives people of the right to make uh, decisions, be accountable on their own behalf. I mean, it, it strikes me as a kind of colonialism that we have imposed in our own country. And uh, as we've seen in other parts of the world, colonialism is a system that ultimately doesn't work. Nineteen eighty four, that symbolic point in time by which we'll all have come under total management, total control. Nineteen eighty four will have special significance in Prince Edward Island. Nineteen eighty four marks the end of the island's fifteen year economic development plan. By nineteen eighty four, PEI may well distinctly close to George Orwell's chilling new world. Tonight on the McIntyre file, we'll document the emergence of a province unlike any other province, a province that is not a province, but an agency of the federal government, designed, built, and inhabited by civil servants. If you live in Prince Edward Island, 67 cents out of every dollar you spend come directly from Ottawa. The rest comes from an economy increasingly dominated by the federal government. Farming and fishing, the island's two most important industries, are undergoing a major shakedown and restructuring. Health services are being rationalized. Education is undergoing a revolution. Even downtown development here in Charlottetown, all under federal supervision. It's all being paid for with federal money, and in every system yet devised by man, whoever pays the piper calls the tube. Among all the special economic cases in Canada, PEI is more special than the others. Not necessarily the most distressed, but the only one with its own private war on distress. A plan, signed a decade ago by these men. A social and economic revolution that will cost hundreds of millions of dollars before it's through. The plan pays the piper. The tune is called by a group which has to be unique in a democratic jurisdiction. It's called the Joint Advisory Board. A ten-member committee, five from PEI, including the Premier, who is co-chairman, and five federal civil servants, including the Deputy Minister of Regional Economic Expansion, J.D. Love, who is the other co-chairman. The unique thing about this board, which works in secrecy, establishing priorities, policies, and programs for PEI, is that on it, the bureaucrats sit down as equals with the elected ministers. Recognizing the fact that most of PEI's revenue comes from the federal bureaucrats' realm, realistically, their authority has to be recognized as more than equal. David McDonald, Tory MP for Egmont, National Grey Critic, finds much to worry him in his own backyard. means that we now have, in a sense, uh, an anonymous government responsible to no one. That, that seems to me to be something that your average democratic-minded Prince Edward Islander would object to. Why, why is it allowed to, to continue like that? I guess for two reasons. First of all, because it is a, a kind of... Uh, mysterious, uh, non-public institution. It's very hard to get upset with something you can't see and put your hands on. Secondly, be islanders have become increasingly sort of dependent upon uh, outside manipulation, outside forces. And I think there's a sense of helplessness, unfortunately. I think there's a feeling that, uh, well, it's likely being done f for our own best interests and uh, there's not very much we can do about it. Uh, but these five people, they're not elected, they're not responsible to anyone, we can't get rid of them, uh, and yet they have total veto power over many of the decisions that are made. And in fact, they, they will often trade off uh, things that are in the federal field where they do have some responsibility, uh, and they will say, okay, we will go along with that, provided the province will do this in, in a totally provincially field, you see. I think PEI, in terms of the two choices you have given me, is tending towards a, a sort of a dictatorial type of regime where decision-making has become very centralized, 
and the ability uh, for the individual to have some say or to be able to participate in, in the types of decisions that are going to affect him has become quite limited. Dr. Michael Keane of the University of PEI sees danger for people in development that moves decision-making further away from them. I think it's two things. I think it's a, it's a feeling of complete helplessness, for one, and it's a feeling of complete alienation from the system. The individual feels that decisions are made that he has no control over, decisions are made that he has no voice in, he can't shape his future. Uh, with the result that he gives up. And of course, in giving up, he becomes um, dependent and loses his own creativity, loses his own ability to be productive and to uh, cater for himself. And I think this is very dangerous, very, very sad that this thing should be happening. I think that uh, Prince Edward Island is not unique in this. Uh, we're not the only part of the Maritimes dependent on, on federal handouts and dependent Mary on Boyd, a sociologist, has studied regional development patterns in detail. Most of the Maritimes, and I shouldn't put that just on a government level, but it's the way that the door has been opened to branch plants of American multinational corporations and to central Canadian business to come in. But the whole centralization uh, process that began with Confederation has affected all of the Atlantic region and not just Prince Edward Island. You know, it's, it's, it's happened. Uh, communities have died and are still dying today. And uh, in my mind, uh, one has to assess the results of a program, never mind the intentions, never mind the motivations. Those may be the very best in the world. But the results are that the political culture uh, and the economic self-reliance of Prince Edward Island have been very heavily undermined, indeed. This is an interpretive center. It's a new wrinkle in the Prince Edward Island tourist industry. It's the first of three developments proposed for the island in an effort to alter tourist travel patterns, to get visitors interested in something more than the cultural and historic attractions of Charlottetown and the beaches of Cavendish. In theory, it makes sense. In practice, it's already presented problems. Parts of the island are saturated with tourist development bordering on the grotesque. Elsewhere, there's little or no activity. But the centers represent another example of federal priority setting. The half million dollars spent on this development might have saved a local fruit processing plant which died and took 250 jobs with it. More seriously, one of these centers near Summerside ran headlong up against the province's own land use policy. The provincially supported land use commission backed citizens who complained that the Prince County tourist development was an intrusion on good farmland. But the provincial government promptly moved to exempt itself from commission controls. Ian McQuarrie is a former chairman of the land use commission. It seems to me and, and other observers that given government decisions like the one on the interpretive center in Summerside, that that the government has already taken the spine out of the Land Use Commission. Well, I think it's a regrettable move because I think the Commission is building, has built, and continues to build a certain amount of confidence with the public. Now, one of the things that the public is very clear upon, in fact, perhaps one of the few things they're very clear on, is that they want government to operate by the same rules as the people, developers, and small farmers, and what have you. The move which I think led from the interpretive center decision was one in which government very deliberately said, no, we are not going to follow the same rules as the other people. I can't help but think that this will have a negative effect on the attitude of people toward the commission and thus make the commission's work that much more difficult. Islanders worry that the land use commission will go the way of another group, the Rural Development Council which was established to give ordinary people a voice in the development of their province. The council was funded by government, and when it became overly critical of the way development was shaping up in PEI, the funding was withdrawn. Macquarie was active on the council during the early days. The Rural Development Council essentially, in my terms, had its throat cut. It started uh, in a kind of a blaze of optimism as a sort of public participation, power to the people movement where community work has really got out, really moved in with the people and found that a lot of things brought a lot of problems to the attention of government, 
often in ways that were uh, perhaps less, well, which created quite a public stir, media problems and so on. The uh, council became more and more heavily dependent on government through funding, we built quite a large organization. The funding was then withdrawn and the RDC continues to function, but in a much, much smaller capacity and I think in a rather ineffective capacity now. I think that they were assassinated and I think that people do well to remember that fact. People who spend all their time in the theoretical world of policy making, and Ottawa is for Canada the center of that world, love the opportunity to tinker, to put their theories and their preaching into practice. I think that uh, PEI uh, intrigues people who have a kind of, uh, what shall I say, a kind of uh, paternalistic or social work mentality which says, uh, here's an, an ideal test plot. Now, if we want to float a new federal program and we don't know how it's going to fly, let's take uh, a control situation. People have said to me, federal planners have said to me, look, the fact that it's an island and can be distinctly separated from other uh, parts of society means that we can try something out here and we'll know because of this control situation of whether or not it works. PEI is different in many ways. It's the only province in Canada where provincial schools are supported by federal money and in small ways. PEI is the only province in Canada where children have social insurance numbers and cards. It's just one more uh, attempt to get us all sort of numbered off and lose our individuality. I think it's rather ridiculous that in the smallest province with 120,000 people that we should be the first that should all be numbered in total. Um, and it's such a neat figure to try out federal programs with. The problem is our own government goes along with it. In the early 1980s, Ottawa will transfer the administration of Veterans Affairs to Charlottetown. It will be a major economic gain for the province, a major change in the face of the city. Already, processes now familiar in the island system have started. One of the first decisions, the location of a new Veterans Affairs building here in the most congested part of the city. That decision was discovered and it was changed because, ironically, one of the first casualties of that development would have been this war memorial. Pat Goody made that discovery, and it was just one more intrusion into a jurisdiction that he, an elected member of Charlottetown's city council, felt should have been the subject of honest consultation. I find as a, as a city alderman that we spend a great deal of time almost like the rabbit chasing a carrot on the end of the stick. Different levels of government keep saying to us, we'll give you this if you'll give away that right or that power. And uh, I think you have to try and fight against giving away the, the decision-making ability and still try and get the dollar inputs from the other levels of government. Do you ever get that feeling of being manipulated? Uh, yes, as continually. A... You know, I find that uh, uh, more and more uh, I reach conclusions which a month later I realize I reached because someone fed me information designed to make me reach that conclusion and I like to think that I'm a free independent spirit. I don't like to think that I'm easily led but that has happened to me in the last three years. But Once again it's that rabbit chasing the stick or the carrot on the stick you see. You don't get the development unless you let them be the masters and I guess maybe this is what you were referring to earlier. Uh, maybe more of what I think is still here is gone. When people like you start putting questions like that to me, I begin to wonder just how much they have taken from us. But in that particular case, you don't get the development unless you let them be the master. They say they're paying the bill, and uh, so they run the show, or you don't get the show. Well, I think there is some very serious things going on from a constitutional, from a legal, uh, and particularly important from a practical point of view. Constitutionally, the province is probably on pretty thin ice as far as the Joint Advisory Board and locking its jurisdiction, its sole jurisdiction in education, to a federal provincial agreement which can only be ch uh, changed or amended by the agreement of both parties. But that's a constitutional nicety, which I don't think is as significant as the effects of having a very heavy intrusion of federal presence here, uh, not so much uh, or even significantly in terms of personnel, but in terms of money that pays for programs which are tied in some shape or another
to federal provincial joint agreements, whether they're shared cost programs, whether they're uh, negotiated agreements like the PEI development plan, uh, whether they're uh, roads or school construction programs, whether in or outside of the plan. Uh, it's the elephant and the mouse. Secrecy, an increasingly contentious factor in government, particularly in Canada. Jim McNeil, publisher of the weekly Eastern Graphic in Montague, has fought the suffocating air of secrecy in the island's planning and development process. For example, it was a, it was a, a good almost two years after the original signing did we even know what uh, was in the agreement, really. Um, later on, there was uh, a sort of check made on how the development plan was going, and there was uh, eight different sectors were examined by independent people, paid for by the government. These consultants looked into the plans, uh, how the plan was developing, and in many cases, found that it wasn't working out. And this was after the first three years. Uh, and uh, even those reports only became public knowledge um, a good deal close to a year after the, the government had actually ob obtained them. And uh, uh, then later, when we went into the second phase of the development plan, it was uh, 18 months after, before even the agreement that was signed between Ottawa and Charlottetown became public knowledge. Nowhere in Canada does the land mean more to people than here on the island. And nowhere in the Atlantic region is there a greater potential for developing the land into a growth industry. And yet, after years of economic development, the drift away from the land has continued here, just as it has everywhere else. We're losing a way of life. We're losing a base of uh, education for for many islanders. We've lost our school, uh, small schools, we've lost our railway stations, we've lost our, our, our post offices, we've, uh, we've lost so much that had, a, had an economic base for the rural community as well as a base of uh, participation in, in what's happening. But the culprit has to be the provincial government rather than the federal government. I think it's the way in which the the plans have been designed and the way in which the monies have been spent under the comprehensive development plan have tended to uh, uh, transform the landscape on Prince Edward Island and to give us the sorts of things that we have today, such as the decline in, in family farms, the decline in rural settlements, and this type of thing. Some people suggested that that is a phenomenon that, that, that is general throughout the Western world that there is a, a drainage from rural areas into more urbanized areas. Is, is PEI just not being consistent with, with the rest of the world? Yeah, well, yes, the pattern is one that exists throughout the world. It's one that's very strong in Canada. Uh, I don't particularly see any reason why it should be on Prince Edward Island, which is a province that has as its main resources agriculture and fishing. Where is the development plan now? You've been in it damn near 10 years now. Yeah. I think it's a piece of history. I, I don't think the development plan as such exists. Uh, there's still a few people who like to argue about its uh, good and bad points, but it's like arguing about uh, the Second World War. It's, it's there, it's taken place, and there's nothing you can do to change what's happened. The, uh, the crucial thing, though, is that the central planning element, the Joint Advisory Board, is still very much in place, is still meeting, is still making decisions. And in effect, we have yielded over basic autonomy for Prince Edward Island to a group of people that uh, no one could name and no one sees and who are responsible uh, to who. Premier Alec Campbell is the man in the middle, juggling the province's economic welfare, its autonomy, and his own political career with his fingers crossed. The first thing a Premier uh, uh, begins to realize when he gets elected is that there's damned little flexibility after all your commitments are made. Uh, provincial governments have a flexibility of, let's say, one or two percent of their budget, discretionary spending that they can redirect. The rest of it goes to pay your teachers, your nurses, run the health, social uh, programs, and ongoing programs, and the government uh, tab as well. Well, the development plan gave Prince Edward Island 
a 25% flexibility. But how can you say that the province is free to originate programs when the province is tied into something that, uh, called the Joint Federal Provincial Advisory Board on which you have federal civil servants with equal power to, to you, yeah. a, a man elected <clears throat> by the people of Prince Edward That is the mechanism that makes it all possible. But it's not a democratic mechanism, is it? It's, uh, it, it's not very democratic um, if uh, we sit here and have available to Prince around only the dollars that spin out from national programs, because none of them ever fit. The national housing programs don't fit the needs of PEI. The national uh, grain storage programs don't fit the needs for PEI. But why should J. Douglas Love, a federal civil servant who was never elected to anything in his life, sit down as an equal with you, who, who have been selected by the majority of Prince Edward Islanders, to, to represent them? How, how can equal, he assume uh, equal, equal, equal sense, status? Well, uh, it's not equal status. Uh, the province has initiated, uh, let's say, a program for the coming year. These are the elements in it. And Mr. Love represents the, uh, the federal government's system of getting uh, these projects from Prince Edward Island through a federal system, through a federal uh, treasury system. And I can tell you that without that mechanism, if PEI had a good idea, it would take us four or five years, and probably the upshot would be that the damn thing would be turned down the federal cabinet because there's too little sympathy with uh, what's happening in the maritime provinces. But do you not worry about the about the de this, this growing welfareism, this growing dependency in the maritime region yeah. as, as something that will yeah. eventually reduce us to the status of, of welfare yeah. cases? I certainly do. And... Uh, I worry about it because of the general dynamics of the Canadian economy, the way in which 60% of our uh, manufacturing is controlled by uh, multinationals, the way in which um, uh, private industry uh, follows economies of scale and uh, centralizes all of its activities in central Canada, the way we continue uh, to grow in our dependence upon transfer payments mm -hmm. from Ottawa. By transfer payments, I'm talking about the welfareism you're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the unconditional grants and the conditional grants, even the cost share uh, programs uh, of the past where Ottawa designs the programs, if we can afford it, uh, our 50%, that's, that's, we can share. That's the name of the game here now. That is not the name of the game here. There's uh, under the DREE program, there's a commitment uh, to give Prince Edward Island 25 or 30 million dollars in the coming year. But it's our responsibility to determine how the 25 million dollars is to be spent. And that is a heck of a lot better than uh, Ottawa sending down 25 million dollars more for welfare. The problem is that the Premier now talks a language about the uniqueness of small community-based enterprises while being locked into an agreement and a system which effectively was going to replicate in Prince Edward Island the industrial structure of Southern Ontario. And, you know, how do you put those two things together? He's got one kind of uh, rhetoric, one kind of expression, and another kind of performance. And so far, he hasn't resolved that tremendous uh, schizophrenia. But the kind of transfer payments that you're talking about are not quite as satisfactory, in my view, as being consistent with that smallest, beautiful image that Prince Edward Island is famous for right across the country. Uh, with respect to uh, the programs that are being developed here, uh, I suggest, I believe, that they are being very sensitive to the notion of uh, local self-reliance and uh, small is beautiful. The family farm is close to the small is beautiful philosophy and uh, opposed to the notion of corporate farming, which this continent pursues with vigor. But under the plan, corporate farming has been on the increase in Prince Edward Island. The family what farm do you mean has under been... the uh, under the plan? Well, okay, corp uh, corporate farming plan is not being assisted in Prince Edward Island under the plan. Uh, how do you explain the fact that, that there has been such a decline in the number of, of family farms in uh, the last decade? Uh, certainly... Uh, 20% decline here, 52% near Brunswick, and 40% uh, in Nova Scotia. We've done well to hold on to what we have, but when I became Premier and before the development plan, every young farm lad in this province uh, couldn't wait to get to Toronto to work in a factory. And we've had to do a great deal to, 
to come around and to develop confidence. And as I say, now half our farmers in Prince Edward Island have made long-term commitments in the development of their plans. Canada's federalism was designed to permit any of the parts to become economically dependent on the whole without losing political integrity. That's how Ontario and Quebec and the western provinces started their lives. Prince Edward Island, however, has had to surrender political integrity, part of the price islanders are paying for economic development. And that should raise questions among other maritimers who have grown dependent on Canadian federal welfare. What's that going to do to you as, as an island, as a province? It's going to do to us perhaps it, what it did to the first settlers, the original settlers of Prince Edward Island. It's going to make us become so dependent that we're going to lose our own initiative, our own wishes. Our, our forefathers came here as an independent people, willing to put effort, every effort into creating a way of life for themselves. We've conspicuously avoided any positive assessment of many benefits the development process is bringing to Prince Edward Island. Improved services, increased incomes, some new jobs. Prince Edward Islanders are paying a high price for those benefits. That price is the erosion of a constitutionally protected status as a province by the intrusion of federal bureaucrats into governing processes they'd be chased away from in other provinces. Perhaps PEI is too small. Perhaps PEI no longer has the right to exist on the same basis as other provinces. But at the very least, any change in its status must be done with the consent of its people, and not in secret. And whether or not federal trusteeship is the answer is questionable. A century ago, the answer to problems confronting our native people was to put them under the care of a federal department. Prince Edward Islanders, before surrendering their futures to another government department, perhaps should ask our Indians how they have fared with theirs. no doubt we're all looking for some type of hand, handout or too many people are for some type of handout in the, the in the final analysis I don't think will be good for them if they become so dependent that they haven't any say in their own future the abuse of political power in New Brunswick we produce new evidence this is CBC